Well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be with you. As um, Tim said earlier, my name's Natalie. So, Peter, let's get some context from him and remind ourselves what's been happening up until, up until this point. He has been with Jesus for three years now. He's been called a fisher of men. He's seen his mother-in-law healed. He's been taken to that mountain and met with Moses and Elijah. And he's been told, on this rock, you will build my church. And then that very night, they've just spent Passover together. Jesus shared bread and wine with them. And Peter then just cut off a servant's ear in defense of Jesus. So Peter's received it all from Jesus. The excitement of the coming kingdom, the call to leadership, and has definitely messed up a few times along the way. But he said yes to being his disciple. He's all in for this way of life. And it's not like Peter isn't trying. But then comes the biggest mess up of all. He denies it. He denies everything. Every single action, word, and promise. The past three years of, the li of his life, just like that. But I love Peter. I love his realness and his emotions. I love him because his denial of Jesus in this way reminds me and gives me comfort for all those times that I too have turned my back on God. I have been there right, right there on that night with Peter again and again and again. I wonder if you can think of times that you have too. And so you may be wondering, Natalie, where is this message of hope tonight? Well, stay with me, because it will come. We're going to be looking at the letter of Peter that he wrote to the church a lot later in his life, on the church weekend away, in a couple of weekends' time. And so this two-week series tonight and next week is setting us up to get to know this man, who eventually, eventually went on to be used in incredible ways, by God. But first, understanding these few short hours in Peter's life can, if we are willing, lead to transformation in our own lives tonight, right now. So in Peter, what's going on? Well, if you look at the scripture in your Bibles, we can see two types of denial. If we look again at the second part of the scripture first, from verse 31 in Matthew, we see, um, sorry, verse 69, we see he denies this way of life that he has been living. As a servant girl approaches him, she says, you were also with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all. He denies the situation. The servant girl is certain that she knows that he has been with Jesus. It's not really a question, it's a statement of fact. You were with him. But Peter is quick to defend. And he says, I don't know what you are talking about. Even to this girl with no status, he is afraid of what she will think. In these few verses, we begin to see the direction that Peter's faith is taking. And then secondly, Peter denies his friendship with Jesus. Not just the situation. It's now bigger. It's his friendship. Verse 71 then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. Verse 72, I don't know the man. And repeated in verse 74, I don't know the man. This is so much more than the situation. This is him denying his relationship he had with Jesus, his friendship he denies his Messiah. Through his denial, Peter is discounting all that happened, would happen, the past, the present, and the future. I don't know the man. But why? Why would someone who loves Jesus so much, who's just cut someone's ear off in defense of him, on that very same night, just a few hours later, turn to say he didn't even know him? Well, there is such a closely connected relationship between denial and fear. 
I was able to chat to someone in our church family this week who is a psychotherapist. And I asked them, what happens when we have fear? When fear takes hold, they said, it's dominant. It's full of what ifs. We catastrophize. It's filled with dark spaces, worst case scenarios. But to be human is to have fear, no? Well, Peter shows us what happens when fear is dominant and we lose our focus on God. And so what happens when we let fear lead to denial of God? Well, let's unpack each of Peter's responses just a little bit more. Firstly, we see the fear of believing what he's professed. So he conforms to the world around him. Verse 74, he began to call down curses and he swore to them. Peter is the one who responded earlier to Jesus, saying, you are the Messiah. So his denial is, well, what if Jesus says, what if Jesus isn't really who he says he is? There's a self-preservation going on from the reality of what could possibly be. When I was speaking again to this person this week, they shared that when we are afraid, our denial of God doesn't allow him to be that powerful presence that he so longs to be in our lives. Peter's response denies God's presence and he begins to conform to the world around him, to swear, to be adamant that he previously, what he previously believed is no longer true. The fear makes him conform. Secondly, Peter's response, his fear of death, So he lies. Rightly, Peter could have been killed if he had confessed that he knew Jesus. It was a scary place to be. But it made him lie about who he really was and what he had been for three years, Jesus' friend. Jesus shares in his message um, of the Beatitudes in Matthew 5. Jesus says, blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. But Peter had forgotten these words. In his fear, he began to ask, what if I die for saying I know him? In that moment, the fear took over and it became better to lie. And finally, this fear of what others would think. So he hides, he scatters, Verse 71, then he went out to the gateway. He was trying to flee and another servant, girl's fi- another servant girl finds him. He was desperate to get away but got caught again. He was so afraid of what people around him would think of his faith in Jesus. Well, I um, grew up in Coventry near the Midlands. Any Midlands people here? I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I had the best childhood, the best family. Um, I had a great education, so many great memories. Um, But my parents sacrificed a lot to make that happen. And I could tell you a whole list of things, but one of those things was that we had a really old car. (laughs) And whatever car it was, something was never quite working, never quite right, and definitely never as good as my friends' cars. Here's some little examples for you. The handles to undo the windows were always these things that had to go round and round and round. Whereas my friends' cars, they had nice electric windows. Ours had very cold seats in winter, and theirs had nice plush electric heated seats. And the big one, ours had a tape player, because I'm so retro and I was born in the 80s. And theirs had a CD player. I wonder if anyone can resonate with any of these um, examples. Well, then one day, my dad was driving me to school. And on a T-junction not far from school, we broke down. The engine was gone. It was a disaster, right in the middle of the road. And if it was all a bit embarrassing before, well, this was a whole new level. I remember wanting to crawl and hide and never be seen again, especially by my friends. But what did I do? Was I the kind, caring, helpful daughter that my dad had brought me up to be? Or was I the coward who left my dad 
and ran away to deal with the problem. Well, it was the second one. I really can remember like running home because I just could not deal with that situation. Fear, it took over. Yes, I was only 10 years old, but I knew the difference between right and wrong. I knew exactly what would help and what wouldn't in that situation. What my dad needed right there and then, he needed me to help him, to support him. But like Peter, I just walked off. I essentially said with my actions, I don't know the man to my own father. To deny knowing my dad in that moment is something that I hugely regret. And I can't explain any more than I was embarrassed of what others would think of me. Just like Peter, fear made me forget who I was and whose I was. So I hid and I scattered. Well, back to Peter. It just doesn't really get much better for him yet. Verse 75, then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken. Before the cock crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The fear which leads to denial, which leads to guilt. It is so tough to read. He knows immediately that it's wrong. The denial has led to shame. He understands what he has done, and he cries. He must, in that moment, have continued to have fear. He must have asked, what happens now? What will Jesus think of me? There's silence in the fear. And so the scripture ends here. There is this unresolved tension in this passage and we're not going to see the full restoration of Peter until next week. But for tonight, if we are really going to grasp God's role in this story, we then we must go back to the first part of today's passage. So if we flip back to verse 31 to 35, here we can find out what God does, what God's character is in this story, and what he is saying to us today. Well, God surrounds the fear. Before Peter even had fear, God is already there. He's loving us, protecting us, and calling us back to him. If we look again at this first part, we can see God's heart for his people and for Peter from the very beginning. Verse 31, we hear Jesus recalling a prophecy from the book of Zechariah. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. This tells us that the shepherd will be struck. The translation implies that struck means put to death and seriously wounded. Well, we've heard Jesus already in another gospel say the words, I am the good shepherd. He has identified himself as the leader of his sheep. So, this tells us Jesus, God himself, is going to be struck to death. And why? Because God's heart is for all humanity, to have a way back to him. We cannot do it by ourselves. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. Arms of love. The shepherd is struck because of love. And this was even before any denial from Peter. Humanity had been denying God's power and presence in their lives for a long time. The story of the Israelites in the Old Testament all the way through is God's people forgetting who they belong to, the covenant that God had given them. But still we go on to read, the sheep of the flock will be scattered. The sheep of the flock will be scattered, he declares. And there's the fear right there. There's Peter's story and the whole story of humanity playing out in a prophecy many, many years before. This prophecy shows us that God in Jesus knew Peter's fears. He knew he would deny him before he even had. God is not surprised by our fears. When you imagine sheep scattering, you can imagine them hiding, fearful because they have lost their way. The fear makes them forget whose they are and who they are. 
The good shepherd is no longer who they are trusting, no longer their focus. And But there is hope today. There is hope. Because like every shepherd, the good shepherd knows his sheep and he protects his sheep. In verse 32, there is one important word. It starts with one important word, but. And it goes on to say, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Jesus is showing Peter a way back, a promise of being rescued, a promise of no longer being scattered, no longer having to hide, no longer having to live in fear. He is making all things new. And for us tonight, well, God is right here in the midst of our fears. He is already here, protecting us, loving us, and calling us back to him. Jesus' prophecy shows us how we can see God is both sides. It's through his death, the shepherd will be struck, and through the resurrection, after I have risen. The book of Colossians says, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Your life, that's all your fears. All those times you said, I don't know the man. All those times you've scattered and hid well, they are hidden in the death and resurrection of Christ. Back to the disastrous car story. My dad was naturally disappointed and upset that I didn't recognize the help that was needed. He didn't need to tell me to be sorry. I definitely was. But has it affected our relationship or the way that he saw me? Well, no. He loved me before that incident, and he continues to love me today. It has not changed the relationship that I have with him. And isn't that the exact same way, but even more of how God sees and chooses to see us? In our rejection of him, he loves us. Fear makes us human, and God knows that. He is the God of second chances. He still uses Peter, and he'll still use us. And we will see a lot more of that next week. But for now, so we all have fear. It's natural. But what are we going to do with it? Well, as followers of Jesus, we are called not to yield to fear. Because it will stop us from recognizing who God is. We need to address those fears in our lives and not let them lead to a place where it takes control and has the final say. So instead of conforming to the world, let us be stink distinctive. Let, us, let our accent give us away. Verse 73 tells us that it's Peter's accent who convinces people that he knew Jesus. But what if our accent gave us away in the best way possible? What if we had an opportunity to share him through our Jesus accent, if you like? Well, just... To illustrate this, on Monday night, I got to be with our young people at our Monday night youth. Um, and one of our young people brought along an exchange student. And um, my experience of exchange, exchanges in the past is that you give them a really typical British experience. You give them fish and chips or take them to London on a London bus. Um, but I can't remember ever bringing anyone to church. And that's probably because I never did. Um, but this person did not question that. They brought them to um, youth. They allowed them to hear scripture, to pray. Out of fear of being judged, embarrassed, or not having the right answers, it could be really easy to not come to church that week, to let that exchange student see everything but your faith. But this person didn't even think of that. And to me, that said so much about them not choosing, um, choosing not to deny their faith but to let their accent give them away. Our accents can be transformational. And instead of hiding, of scattering, like Peter did, we can trust that God is right there in our fears. He is both sides of it. Even in our rejection of God, he has made a way back to him. Through his kindness, he leads us to repentance. 
for all those times we said, I don't know the man. Whether consciously or subconsciously, we need and can ask for his forgiveness tonight. And finally, instead of denying God's power, bring your fears to him. That's what he says. 1 John 14 verse 8 says, perfect love casts out fear. Let's not get caught in a slavery of fear as his followers. And if you know it has taken over your life and you're not the person God made you to be because you're living with fear of whatever that might be, bring those to him. Or maybe tonight it's the fear of others. If you're feeling called to pray for those living in fear. And news reports have been full of stories of people in fear in Ukraine. And if you know someone or have Ukrainian friends, come, come tonight to God. Spend time with him. We're called to pray and intercede for our brothers and sisters. To ask God to give them courage in spite of fear. We can be real with God today. So our promise of the future, well, God's promise to us is that we are no longer slaves to fear, but we are called to be children of God, to stand in that promise and rest on the knowledge that perfect love casts out fear. He takes our fears. Jesus takes our fears and he says, I know, I've been there and I'm right here now. I haven't left you even if it feels silent. And I'm also going ahead of you to prepare so you won't have to be afraid anymore. Amen.